um, you know, I think, I don't think I realized, there was never a conversation I had with Tony, but I don't think I realized the extent to which he was quite ambivalent about being the television uh, personality that he became. From the very beginning, he was not sold on the idea that he wanted to be on television. And there was, again, a lot of fits and starts and uh, questioning and, and sort of self doubt about taking that path. As much as he wanted it, he also felt uh, conflicted. And I think that kind of is, was a through line throughout his entire television career. In a way, I think that's what made him such a compelling television presence because he wasn't uh, out there as a shiny showman. You know, there was always that little bit of um, uh, self-deprecation and, you know, awareness and kind of breaking the fourth wall. Like, I know some of this is ridiculous and, you know, I, I, I know that, uh, I know I'm lucky and I know I'm also ridiculous. Uh, and I think he was, he was really brilliant at kind of balancing those elements, uh, that the self-doubt and the, uh, and the, you know, the incredible charisma that he had. It doesn't seem like, um, he would have done television. It doesn't seem to fit with his character. Um, the, the product that they created eventually um, very much uh, captured his, his personality and his viewpoint. Um, but early on, um, he was just kind of going through the motions, don't you think? Absolutely, yeah. And uh, his, his producing partners, Chris and Lydia, uh, go into that extensively in the book about how you know, they, it was their idea. They had Wreckage and Confidential. They heard he was doing a second book. And they, as producers do, they're constantly sort of looking for the next story to tell. And they reached out to him and said, would you consider working with us? And he was pretty nonchalant about it. And also, I think they realized quickly, pretty conflicted again about, uh, I think he understood what it meant to sort of make that leap into being a television personality. And uh, in a way it was, it made him into somebody that he had always sort of despised. You know, I think as a, yeah. as a, um, anonymous cook toiling in obscurity. I think there's a, a little bit of a, an attitude toward people who are out there in the spotlight. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it wasn't, I don't think it ever fit very naturally in, into his character. And, and there was always, a, you'll hear a lot of his um, colleagues in television production saying that he was constantly trying to figure out ways to be on camera less. You know, his big uh, line was more B, less me, meaning more B-roll, more beautiful scenery, more, you know, shots of other people, more, more of what is what we're here to see and less of, of my face. Uh, so he was, there was this conflict straight through from beginning to end with, with, uh, with being on camera. You can see it, uh, you know, and if people have seen the documentary that came out this summer that touches on it as well. And, and the, the book goes uh, a lot deeper into that, just those feelings of ambivalence and the kind of back and forth about, um, uh, you know, all the wonderful things about getting to make television. You know, Tony was a, um, an absolute, uh, just mad for films uh, from a very young age, just watched movies voraciously. And it was, you know, one of his favorite things to watch and talk about films, he was obsessive. So the fact that, it, you know, late in his life, he got to, in some ways, be a filmmaker uh, yeah. through the medium of television was, uh, was a dream come true. And I think that's, that's a hard thing to walk away from uh, just because, you know, one's ego sometimes demands that you, you know, take stock of how silly the whole enterprise is. Did you ever talk to him about, um, uh, the first series was called A Cook's Tour, is that correct? That's right. Yes. Okay. So I actually, yeah. I, I actually went back and watched. Um, I think the first episode they, they were in Tokyo. Um, mm. it, it wasn't the Tony that we got to know in later years. It was. It was a very. It was similar. Kind of had his voice a bit, but he definitely didn't seem mm -hmm. comfortable. Um, did you ever talk to him about those those early episodes? And did he consider like? quitting in the middle of it or just flying back home or just saying forget about this this is ridiculous what what did he say about those early days you know I never spoke with him specifically about Cook's tour and about all of mm. that early ambivalence and that was one of the things that that sort of surprised me when I started this project of, of making this book 
uh, his producing partners, Chris and Lydia, were some of the first people I spoke to. And, and their story, which they share really brilliantly in the book about you know, who, who and how Tony was in those early days was surprising to me. But the thing that, that I did talk to him about and that really stuck with me and, and surprised me when he was alive, uh, we were backstage uh, before an appearance that he was doing to promote our cookbook, Appetites. This was in 2016. It was at the end of what had been a very successful book tour. He was uh, appearing in theaters of two to 3,000 seats, completely sold out. You know, people paying extra money to be able to take a selfie with him and mm. you know it was just um, a really extraordinary success and so this was the last one of those events and there's just the two of us in the green room before he went on and uh he said oh god I, this is i'm this is the, such an embarrassing what an embarrassment for me i said what do you mean this is you you've crushed it you know and everybody is really enjoying hearing what you have to say and I, and I, had, I had been to a number of these events, so I had sort of seen his talk evolve. And, you know, it was like a stand-up comedy routine, really, for an hour. And he was like, I just, every single one of these, I just feel like the biggest fucking fraud. I can't believe, it's embarrassing to me that people have spent money to come and hear me talk. It just feels like a fucking joke. And uh, I guess that's, um, what do we call that? Imposter syndrome, right? And mm -hmm. And I... It wasn't entirely shocking to me that Tony had it, but that he had it to that extent. And at that stage in his career, and after having, you know, had it been approved to him night after night that people really wanted to hear what he had to say and really wanted to spend their money to, to have the privilege to sit in the, in the theater with him and buy his books. Uh, that was really interesting to me that, and that it was, you know, some of it with nerves. And again, that, that, that he would have nerves at that stage in the game when he had been a professional public speaker for at least 10 years. Um, so I think it really just speaks to the fact that although people see him on television and, and, and they see the charisma and they see the humor and the brilliance uh, and the ability to speak in complete paragraphs, that there was also this, uh, this insecurity and this sense of being an imposter and this sense of sort of not believing uh, how, where he had ended up in life. Uh, so, and I think that, that, you know, makes him for, makes for a much more interesting person. And, yeah. uh, you know, if you read the book, you'll see that there's just, if he was just a, a, a one dimensional kind of, you know, America's next Marlboro man, you know, I, I don't think he would have been as enduring and compelling a, a figure as, as he was.